you for asking me. Uh, it's quite all right. Well, because I, I know you strangely mainly through your kind of magic right. work, your yeah. mentalism. Yeah. And it's only more recently through kind of ghost stories and I suppose, was it Dead Set really that kind of thrust you into the... Mainstream I don't know bit. really I mean I guess a bit, a bit more yeah, that was the first telly I'd done for ten years because I'd um, I, you know acting is my obsession and that's my I mean I'm a bit obsessive anyway but acting is the thing that has always been my number one drive so um, the magic thing was just a fantastic hobby that meant that I could make creative decisions as an actor and still earn a living doing this other stuff you know which was where the magic was but in those 10 years I did about 15 films you know that were some got released here like Severance and um, Death at a Funeral and then others just played festivals and did that sort of stuff all got released in different countries so but Dead Set was certainly the first TV that I'd done for 10 years that seemed to sort of land yeah but acting was sort of always been your that's your always drama. the number one yeah did you go to drama school yeah yeah I went to Guildhall 1984 to 87 oh cool yeah right so the the magic's just this brilliant hobby that even with all the Darren stuff that was always in my head you know I was always saying to them this is just my hobby I, you know I so I would write the stuff and then you know Darren and I would work on it together and then I you know go off and do a film or something and then six weeks later I'd be back and we'd work on something else you know so it was it was brilliant it's, but is it something have you dropped down the stuff you're doing with Darren now I don't work with I haven't worked with Darren for two years oh really so Enigma was the last show that I did with the last stage and show so that you I did directed with that one I wrote okay. it with Darren and we I directed it yeah okay. so up until that up until Enigma Darren and I wrote everything in that first decade that was on TV and a couple of other people dropped in and helped sometimes and then the stage shows the four stage shows Darren and I wrote everything and then I directed those four shows so this tour that's out now is the first one that I have almost nothing to do with ok yeah. so uh, was that because you wanted to concentrate on other stuff I, I just I've been saying for a couple of years you know I've sort of been saying for eight years this is my acting is getting busier and busier and it's it, it was always very lucky that everything just sort of fell into place, dates-wise. And it just got to the point after Enigma where it was I was so busy with the acting that they just... They just and the writing with ghost stories and stuff that there just wasn't time, you know. And as that was and is my hobby, it just felt, OK, well, that's... And also, we've done a decade, you know. It's a long time. Mm. Because didn't they ask you kind of pre Darren didn't they yeah. ask you to do it yeah they did is there ever a point where you kind of because Darren is so massive there is not now. one there has not been one second not even a flicker of a second that I've ever thought because oh. it's just not what I want mm. I mean there's, there's a, the only thing that ever matters to me is being happy and, and the pursuit of happiness and acting you know aside from family obviously but acting is the thing that makes me truly happy so and you know they offered it to me and offered me a very nice deal and but I just no interest in it and I suppose also because your heart wouldn't be in it like it is for Darren it's, it wouldn't have been so there wouldn't have been the longevity that there's yeah. been because I'd have done that first special for Channel 4 and then I would have been okay so Channel 4 films can we talk to them I've been on Channel 4 now I mean are there any films going on that I could be in you know that, I would never it just would never have worked out the way it's worked out and Darren's you know he's brilliant at what he does so you're in Bath for Abigail's party. Yes. You play Lawrence. Yes, do I do play Lawrence. Yeah, and is yeah. it? Do you like it? <laughs> I love it. It's it's been absolutely brilliant. You know the sh- the play is just amazing. It's a fantastic cat. I mean, I know every actor always seems to say that on jobs, but this is just a brilliant job. It's a very happy show. Um, we did it for six weeks at the Chocolate Factory in London, which is the most amazing theatre, and it just did incredible business. Lots of ice going on there at the moment. <laughs> you can hear that. We're in a pub. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and we're now going into the West End. So, you know, we finish here on Saturday night, and then we have two weeks off, and then we're doing 16 weeks at the Wyndham's Theatre, which is just amazing. It's the most beautiful theatre. So it's been a brilliant... It's just a brilliant play to do. 
you know, Mike Lee's writing is amazing. Lindsay Posner's direction's been brilliant. Mike Lee's been in and worked with us a little bit. And it's, it's been extraordinary. Great. So how far in... So how long was it at the Chocolate Factory? Six before? weeks. Six weeks. Oh, so. Six weeks? I think seven weeks, something like that. Yeah. Okay. But then how far into that do you kind of know that, oh, it's going to go somewhere? Well, we knew it was going to Bath because Bath was a co-production. Okay. So it was always... That was always Six there. weeks there and then a week in Bath. And then... The show at the Chocolate Factory sold out properly. You can't get a ticket sold out in about a week before it even opened. So how many seats is that? Like it's about 180 seats. Okay, theater. so it's a very intimate. Kind it's a of very thing. intimate theatre, yeah. But nevertheless, you'd be surprised how hard it is to sell out any sort of venue. You know, well, this was fantastic that it did this so quickly. And once the reviews came out, which were sort of universally excellent there was immediate interest then for the West End and so by the time we finished there at the Chocolate Factory we knew we were going into the windows so it was great and it's the same cast and everything exactly the same well. cast exactly the same production yeah and then so because you'll be doing that every night for, yeah. for 16 weeks mm-hmm. is that kind of it feels like a real job, you know, because you, you're going into work every yep. day, I suppose. And I suppose you did that with Ghost Stories for a yes. year, didn't you? Uh, yeah. I did over 500 performances of Ghost Stories. I did 13 months in the West End. Um, I had a couple of little tiny blocks off. But it is, but God, I just... It's amazing. It's an amazing thing to be doing. You know, an actor playing a lead in a West End show, in a brilliant production. I mean... That 16 weeks will fly by because mm. it's just such an exciting thing to do. I'm very passionate about it, I'm very enthusiastic about it. I always have been. I just I love what I do. Mm. I saw. I can't remember who it was, but they said some actors say how do you, it gets boring after a certain amount of time. But then he was saying, you know, well that's the job. You know, that's you yeah. are employed to go in and do the same thing. And there's actually a comfort in doing exactly the same thing every night yeah but do you do you have to change it a bit or well I don't I mean I don't find it boring because well there are a few things really the first is that you know there are lots of people who do boring jobs lots of people who are doing repetitive boring work again and again and again and again so you know to think that being an actor on stage every night doing the same part is boring I never get that I just think how lucky how lucky I am to do it but the other thing is, I, you know, this is where the, the fact I've done other jobs and magic and all of that stuff is. What that has always allowed me to do is to make artistic choices. So I only try and choose things that the role's a brilliant role. So there's enough there to keep you excited every night for 16 weeks. You know, in Ghost Stories, it was a remarkable opportunity to, you know, to do the same, to recreate that same thing again and again and again and again. I suppose with Ghost Stories as well, because you, I mean, you co-wrote that. Jeremy, Jeremy Dyson and I wrote it and we yeah. directed it. But was it Holmes. initially your idea? Yeah. You sort of brought it to the table yeah. and said, this yeah. is going to be good. Yeah. Yeah, so I suppose that adds an extra... Well, of course, that adds an extra, you know, this is our baby to mm-hmm. it. Yeah, but I just think... You know, the, your job as an actor is to go out there and give exactly the same performance, deliver it every night, and yet keep it absolutely fresh and real and make it sound and feel like it's never been there before. You know, I think it's a great challenge. I love it. And the passion is really there for the acting rather than the directing or is that taking I love the directing the... as well no I love them all I'm lucky <laughs> you know I'm lucky that I do I mean the acting is always kind of above and then yeah the directing is amazing I love that and the writing is wonderful I love that and <laughs> the magic's great I love that you know I'm, I'm lucky that I've got a lot of passions that I love doing stuff that you enjoy yeah. all the time I, yeah, suppose, yeah. I suppose that's the thing isn't it that if you are doing something that you love all the time yeah it's little to complain about yeah I yeah there is I think people complain a bit too easily um, so yeah I try I don't like I don't like moaners I don't like moaning it's pointless you know just just change keep it alive and keep you know keep grateful for the fact that 
I get to do this stuff, you know, and I love it. So with um, Ghost Stories, yeah. is there, I mean, because it was a runaway success, really, mm-hmm. wasn't it? I suppose yeah. you didn't amazing. envisage what the success it would be. No, I mean, I, I did think, you know, when Jeremy and I were talking about it, I, you know, I did say, like, I think that if we can deliver this, it could be a really exciting thing. And hopefully there are enough people as warped as you and I that would want to go see it. And thankfully there were and there are. You know, so, no, I mean, it's impossible to envisage it's going to run in the West End for over a year. I mean, that's just... You know, for a play with no big stars in it, that's really an extraordinary thing, you know. Um, But it was a huge success, yeah. I can't quite believe it, really, because it just sort of feels like our thing. It doesn't quite seem real. And I suppose that, because it was in your head for a long time as well, to see it uh, it must be a bit surreal. It is a bit surreal. It is a bit surreal, yeah. And also, we were, Jeremy and I were incredibly involved in every single step of how it was advertised how it was marketed you know we were at all those meetings and so we were involved in everything it was a great learning curve as well mm. so do you is that something you want to do again a sort of yeah or... I love it yeah. I'm a bit of a control freak so yeah I love it <laughs> you know the first play that I did for 10 years uh, I hadn't done when I was just doing films and and I came back uh, to do a play at the tricycle called Moonlight and Magnolias that was about David O'Selznick and how he wrote uh, Gone With The Wind with uh, two other fellas and it was amazing because the guy is just was this extraordinary control freak beyond you know beyond con- he's the control freak's control freak you know it really was a, a, just an amazing obsessive man and there was almost nothing that came out of his mouth that I didn't agree with you know it felt so I'm learning this stuff and you know there, he was getting laughs but I thought this is true I don't get it yeah. so it really felt like a perfect fit for me playing that role but then after being such a well because it was completely your thing you had a lot of say over the direction of that going back to being directed mm. is that okay is it's fantastic that you just it's, I yeah, it's the fantastic. pressure's off a bit the pressure is off it's fantastic as long as the person is good when it's not good it's frustrating and you have to turn that other head off you have to turn off because I've also you know I've done a lot of you know with the Darren stuff I did 10 years of edits mm. sitting in edits and so I'm fortunate I've got this very wide breadth of experience and, but there are times you know when you just have to let them get on with it <laughs> let them do it you just thing. worry about your part of it yeah mm. it's, it's very concentrated the, the bit that you're responsible for I yes. suppose yeah. it? so with uh, is there like a tour planned for Ghost yeah I think Story? Ghost Stories I think Ghost Stories is touring we're just waiting to get it all signed off I think it starts touring January 2013, so next January. Okay. So it's going to do a tour. It opens in Moscow in August or October or something. Yeah. Yeah. And interestingly, it's still set in England because the Russians don't believe that they have ghosts. They believe that England and Scotland has ghosts. So that's... Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Is that the same for the Canada? Is it in Canada? The Cana- no, it was in Canada. It was it in was. Toronto for a while. No, that was set in Canada. Mm-hmm. So uh, we produced an international version of the script, which is um, because there were so many references to sort of everyday things for us. It makes no sense if someone's trying to get a phone call going, O2, why aren't you working? You know, you need it to say, in Rogers, if they're in Canada or in Russia, Vodafone or whatever it'll be, you know. But no, the Canadian one was absolutely set. Okay, yeah. So, um, I suppose also you're going to... Do you have to make the theatre look... Because when I saw it, it was all sort of... Yeah. We yeah. designed the theatre almost yes. with all the stuff hanging up. Yeah. You do that all the way well, around they, the yeah, yeah, we did in Toronto. And then I think this, this is a slightly different thing now. In Moscow, that's... You know, we've gone from being, we are taking it and putting it in Toronto to people now sort of buying the rights to do it and then they put it on and they get what's called the Bible, which is, you know, it shows them what to do and then they do that and then Jeremy and I will go over and oversee that and our assistant director goes and helps them mount it. Okay. I suppose also in that one you are, I mean, you are an actor, but you are also addressing the theatre, yeah. aren't you? It's, it was an odd, it was... A, it was a deceptively difficult performance, that, really, because 
you have to really set your in that show you had to really set your ego aside because it wasn't it had to feel like it wasn't a performance at all you know it just had to feel like a, just a le- and again I'm being very cautious about what I say because oh, yeah. there will be people who won't have seen it and fingers crossed we'll get the opportunity and it's a show full of surprises you know but it feels certainly for the first 20-15 minutes of the show that it's just a lecture and you're just you know being talked to and you're lulled into this world that is not the world that you end up in being in you know and it is strangely comforting as yes. well it's sort of yeah, yeah. <laughs> God, it was fun. I miss it. I miss doing it. I yeah. really do. It was such an adventure every night. But was it a character as such, or was it kind of you doing the lecture? No, uh, no. Uh, that's a good question. No, it wasn't me. I mean, I, I try to make everything that I do feel as close to me as I can, so that they just feel real. But... You know, it was clearly a lot of my knowledge. You know, mine and Jeremy's knowledge and stuff was in there. But no, it absolutely wasn't me. But but I tried to find a way that sort of just felt like it was, hey, it's me and I'm just talking. You know, until... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, uh, knowing a bit from your background, because you were talking about, you know, ghost sceptic ideas. Yeah. You know, it was quite... It did feel like for me that it that it was an element of you, but then yes. I suppose that's uh... that's yeah. Well, clearly, you know, it was there was a lot of there is a lot of my knowledge and Jeremy's knowledge in there, and a lot of the things that interest us in there. So yeah, it is close to home. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I suppose those are the projects that you feel really strongly about because there's something. Yeah, well, with the Darren stuff as well, there were always agendas that Darren and I wanted to drive through under the drama of the magic that's going on you know we wanted to make our point about you know psychic belief systems and religious belief systems and superstition and homeopathy and all these all these things that were issues that we wanted to bring out and rather than going you know no 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 you shouldn't believe that that's rubbish you know you just we found a different way of doing it which was using that entertainment you know and it was there if you wanted it and if you didn't want it you could just enjoy the shows right and I suppose it's almost the same with what you're doing now because it is a satire isn't it what we're talking about now Abigail's Party Abigail's Party yes yeah Yeah. because uh, do you kind of enjoy having the the agenda behind it behind it yeah I mean I think that where Mike Lee's writing is just amazing is that even though the show is 35 years old, it just feels utterly contemporary. If you strip away the sort of the sort of delicious joy of the cheesy 70s setting, there are still marriages that are as horribly dysfunctional and awkwardly embarrassing and abusive as these relationships that you spend two hours with are, you know, and... That, I think that's what makes the writing so good and so funny is that so many of those laughs as well as the sort of shard and forward of seeing someone else go through it is you recognise those bits in yourself of God I know I know what I feel like when my wife is banging on about that or I know she but when I'm doing telling my funny story that she's heard a thousand times that she's having a fake laugh you know I think it's you know you really see yourself in some of the characters it's quite a I mean forgive me if I'm wrong but it's quite a simple premise isn't it I mean is yeah. it in real time yes it is real time yeah, yeah. aside from the, the same, interval same yeah. setting yeah and is there and quite I suppose quite a lot of your stuff that you've been involved with that I've seen has been quite a simple premise yeah is it something you're quite attracted to in a way sort of yeah, I, a key it is yeah I, I don't know really I mean I think that you know, the funny thing about Abigail's Party is I've done other shows that are incredibly physical, but this show is fundamentally what we're doing now, and it's absolutely exhausting, because the level of concentration that is required is just so... You have to be so on it. Um, in terms of simple plots and premises, you know, I really... There's a great thing in magic, funnily enough, that is, if you can't describe an effect in a sentence, it's no good. Yeah it's no good it's pointless and I kind of feel the same way with stories a lot of the time is that they're so over embellished and so hidden you know the actual kernel of what it's about is so hidden that 
you end up losing the impact of it and that's one of the things that I think I am attracted to is things that just go straight to the heart of what it's about I like that and yeah I suppose it's it just gives you something to there's nothing to embellish it there's nothing to get in the way there's yeah. nothing to yeah. although of course the interesting thing about Abigail's party is it's initially all about that pretense it's all about we are just having the nicest time this is lovely what a lovely interview you know I was underneath it just fucking absolutely can't wait to get away you know I think that that is also but that is apparent you know so that the, you know straight away what the story is the second you see it yeah I suppose you is, is it quite a fairly unpleasant character you play in a way <laughs> kind of yeah yeah I suppose there's, a, and again, in quite a lot of your work, yes. there's, a, there's that twist, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, is a... I've done a lot of extreme characters, yeah. and a lot of kind of unpleasant characters, but I think that, you know, the interesting thing about Lawrence is he is a bit of a prick, but also he's a man whose life is not what he wanted it to be, and who's not allowed to display the things that excite him, you know. And in that respect, there's something really sweet and unfortunate about him as well. You know, it's not... So I like that. I do like extremes. I, only once have I ever done a play or a job where I was just sort of playing a sort of bland, you know, sort of... It was odd. It was a sort of romantic lead, which I was deeply uncomfortable <laughs> with. And... Um, I absolutely hated it. I hated it. I just had nothing to get my teeth into and I just didn't feel required an actor who was so comfortable in their charm that, that, that that's all that was required, which is not what I feel I am at all. I love burying myself in a character and I love... I, I love the idea that a director who's worked with me on one thing only sort of sees me as that role and then sees you in something else it's like oh my god I didn't even you know I really like that that's what I grew up thinking acting was so I really I like that idea it's that transformation and I suppose that's a lot of going to drama school is you, is you learn that don't you yeah kind of yeah I think that what, what's interesting about drama school is it sort of it, it, when it's good it sort of polishes up what what your aspirations are and for me that's what it was you know I grew up sort of worshipping De Niro and Pacino and that, that generation of actors who, who did just lose themselves in roles and so I always wanted to do that that's what I that's what I love you know and, you know I don't know whether or not I truly had those opportunities but I like I like that's the way that I like to work I've seen you in a few comedies. I suppose this is, Abigail's party is a bit of a yeah, for sure, comedy. very funny. Yeah. Okay. Is it? I mean, is it farcical? Or... Yeah, it's borderline yeah. farcical. I mean, that's interesting. Is what it does is it play. It just takes all the conventions of farce, and yet it's so brutal and horrible. <laughs> you know. So, but yeah, it's absolutely a comedy. Yeah. It's strange, actually, farce has kind of come back. Yeah. A bit, uh, but the, there is those. Well, it's twists. not strange though, because it's always the way in times when people are absolutely fucked financially and miserable. It's always the way, you know, that broad comedy just hits home runs. You know, Noises Off is a massive, massive smash again in the West End. You know, as it was 12 years ago, and during the last recession. <laughs> you know. Um, that's not an accident you know people want to escape and want to just enjoy themselves and you know what's interesting is Noises Off is on in the West End we're going into the West End what the butler saw the Joe Orton players going into the West End all at the same time there's these revivals going on of things that are surefire very funny plays with that quite odd British you know twist in them which is terrific Mm. And that's and that is because of the financial position of everyone. Well, I think during recession that happens. Yeah, I really do. People just want a laugh when things around them feel a bit bleak. Mm. That's, um, do they need a rem- an element of what's happening in of in the time? You know, potentially. Well, or I just think they have to deliver. It's the escapism. It is the escapism. Yeah. 
Now you got involved with Campus. You're yeah. In camp- that was was that the first sitcom you were in? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah. Something you want to do more of? I loved it. I mean, I I really loved it. I, it's, I'm still sort of slightly shocked it never got a second series. Yeah. It's quite an odd thing. It just got caught up in the politics of Channel Four, I think. But yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And Victoria Pyle, who created that, who created Green Wing, Smack the Pony, is just an amazing woman. And that was a great way to work. But again, you know, for me, fantastically odd, extreme, bizarre stuff to do, which I really like. Well, it's strange with that one because I think it got caught up in the classic sitcom thing of it didn't perform quite as well yeah. as everything else in the first series. Yeah. So they don't give it a second chance. Yeah. But sitcoms always need a second series. And it, yeah, yeah, and it's that awful thing of it didn't perform because they didn't advertise it. No one knew it was on. I mean, it's one of those head scratches where you just, you know, from the outside looking in, I'm sure there's, you know, they've got their legitimate story, but it got amazing reviews and, you know, its figures built brilliantly. And whilst it still remained a smaller core audience initially, it was, it really built and held its figures and, you know, all of the stuff that should matter. But you know what? I'm I'm very good at doesn't you matter. Yeah. It just doesn't matter, you know. It's a good piece of work. A lot of people liked the show and loved it. Some people hated it. Yeah. And life carries on. <laughs> but it's frustrating for Channel Four because uh, for me that's what Channel Four should be about. I totally agree. Is that you know it might not have the hugest audience. Yeah. But, <laughs> but everything has changed. Everything has changed. You know, Channel Four was about that when there were four channels. Yeah. There are now three hundred channels, and all it's about is audience figures and percentage shares of that audience. You know, so everything else has changed. They need the figures, I suppose. And yeah, and it's almost Sadly. after. Yeah, I mean, almost after one episode, it feels yeah. like the fates, yeah. the fates decided a bit. I mean, I don't know if there's any channels that. Well, Sky is absolutely pouring money into comedy and drama and stuff. I mean, that it's sort of extraordinary to see it. I mean, they are just nurturing and nurturing and nurturing and nurturing talent. And I think that once they hit something that is an in-betweeners or something, then it will suddenly become a major force as opposed to, you know, still a channel that's sort of on, you know, the biggest of those on the fringe of the channels. But it's only a matter of time because they are just commissioning so much work it's amazing that is a point actually I mean because they it never used to be the case that it's think, huge now just huge. very recently yeah, yeah. They've, they've decided to plough all this money into mm. it I suppose it's something that the BBC can kind of learn from in a way yeah, it's hard it's hard because that you know BBC is now accountable for every single penny it's made. Yeah. So, yes. anyway, yeah. Yeah. the additional pressure. Anyway, <coughs> thanks very much. For oh, Julius listen, this. thank you. It's, it's, nice to talk to you. it's all right. I hope you can kind of hear everything okay. Well, he's well. nodding. He's <laughs> nodding, <laughs> and the thumbs are up. So, yeah, thanks listen, very much. Thank you, and come to the Wyndham Theatre, May the fifteenth till September the first to see Abigail's party. Not you. Not every night. You have to come every night. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.